Hey everybody, it's Ryan Metzler here again, and today we're going to take a look at a game from my favorite designer. Not a new game, one that I've had in my collection for quite some time, but somehow had neglected to review. We're going to take a look at In the Year of the Dragon from Stefan Feld. Uh, as I said, my favorite designer. Uh, he makes my second favorite game of all time, Trajan. Uh, and this is one of his older titles. I believe it might currently be out of print. Hopefully uh, we can rectify that at some point. Uh, but the idea of this game is that you were trying to prepare your kind of area of palaces for upcoming events. You know that the events are coming and you're doing your best to mitigate disaster by collecting rice or fireworks or uh, warriors, whatever the case may be. You're trying to make sure that you're ready for the impending doom that will be coming. And that's the central theme of this game is getting prepared for bad things to happen. Uh, real quick, I would like to take a look at what comes inside of this box. We'll see how the game plays and then we'll come back here at the end and give you my already kind of ruined opinion of In the Year of the Dragon. So here you can see the setup for In the Year of the Dragon. Now what we're looking at here is one player's playing area and the main board. Each player will start the game with two palaces, each with two floors in them. This means that they can hold two people. And they can only be built to three floors, meaning they can hold three people. And after that, you'll need to board, build more palaces. You're gonna start with six yuan. Uh, you're gonna start with your deck of people cards. These people cards will be played throughout the game to get you more people. At the start of the game, each player is going to choose two people from this supply, and each player must choose uh, a combination that is not the same as any of the players who have chosen before them. Our player here has chosen a six Buddha, uh, it's a monk, and a five who is a warrior, and these are the younger versions of these people. There are both younger and older versions. The younger versions have higher people numbers, which will advance you more on this people track, which helps with turn order uh, and victory points at some point. Uh, but not only will you advance further on this track, but you're going to have fewer symbols. Now there are symbols on these that indicate how well you perform an action when you take it. Each extra symbol will get you an extra benefit. For example, having this guy will get you an extra rice when you take rice. The older versions, which you can't take at the start of the game, will get you two symbols in some cases, or more, or perhaps fewer, dependent on which guy it is. But this one has two rice symbols, meaning that it would get you two extra rice when you took the get rice action. So each player has to choose a different combination. After that's done, we're going to move on to the rounds of the game, and there will be 12 rounds at the end of which an event will happen, right before scoring. The first two will always be peace, but then you will have to be paying tribute and money, having fireworks in order to earn victory points, having warriors in order to get victory points and protect from losing one of your people, having food in order to kind of bypass a famine, having healers in order to bypass a contagion, and then you'll see that each event duplicates. The first thing in each round that's going to happen is that these event tiles are going to get, or not event tiles, the uh, action tiles are going to get shuffled up and they're going to get distributed into different piles. In this case, there's going to be five piles. Uh, there's going to be two piles of two and three piles of one. Now I have them all upside down, but you can see that there are events printed on these tiles that are going to somewhat correspond with the different events that happen down here. Each of these actions will allow you to somehow prepare for one of these eventual events. The first two rounds, as I said, are peace, so there will be no event, but later on you're going to need resources in order to kind of prepare for these. The first ones being money to pay in tribute, and then fireworks in order to fire off and get victory points. Each player in turn order is going to choose one of these different groups of events in order to activate. So our first player, let's say that it's green because he has 11 people power, uh, and each person else has fewer because they took a different combination of people that gave them less people power. Uh, six and five here adds up to 11, so whatever two starting people you have will move you up that far on the people track. Green being first. They have their choice of any of these five groups of activities or of, uh, of actions that they can take. When they place on one of them, they're only going to get to take one of the two actions if it's a pile of two, or the action they place on if it's a pile of one. Perhaps they see that we have the event of pay paying tribute coming up, and they place on the money event. They're going to get two money for the card, and then they would look and see if any of their people have the money icon on them. Now, they don't have any tax collectors, which have three money icons on them, so they're only going to get the two money from the supply, placing it in their own personal stash. If they had one of the tax collectors, they would have three additional symbols that are printed on there, and they would get three additional money. And if they had two tax collectors, they would get six additional money. The next player then has a choice of placing on any of these piles as well, including the one where a player is already placed. If they want to do so, they must pay three money into the supply in order to do so. It's not three per player, just three if someone else already occupies it. 
perhaps they do have a tax collector and they would like to place here as well, but they would have to pay three money to do so, kind of negating its benefit a little bit. So perhaps they decide to place somewhere else and they place on the rice. This will get you one rice for the card itself and then one for each rice symbol you have on a farmer in your palaces. And each of the actions will have a corresponding person that will give you victory or give you additional benefits if you place on that action. The other actions are building palaces, which will have the builder, and for when you do this, you're going to build one floor of a palace for each of those icons that you have, including the one on the card. You can build your palaces up to level three, which will allow you to store three people in them, and you may build new palaces with the extra floors that you have if you would like. Warriors are going to let you move up on the person track, giving you a better advantage for being in the first player uh, for taking your actions in future rounds, uh, and are going to also help you when the wars come along. That's only if you have the actual warrior people, though. When you do this, you're going to move up one on this track for each warrior helmet that you have. Fireworks are going to let you take fireworks in order to prepare for the fireworks round. The tributes here are going to let you buy these tributes. You pay three money for, two money for the lesser one, which will be worth one victory point, and six money for the greater one, which is worth two at the end of every round. We already went over rice and money, and then the books are going to give you straight up victory points whenever you activate that action. You'll move your marker along this track up here, one space for each book you have, both on the tile and on any of the people that you have in your palaces. After everyone has chosen an action by placing their dragon out and either paying the yuan or not having to pay, you're going to move on to the playing people cards phase in which you're going to acquire new people from the board in order to place into your palaces. Each player will play one of these cards from their hand and these cards will match the different people that are out on the board. Now we've talked about most of these but there are three that we have not yet talked about. That is the geisha who has these fans on her thing and these fans are worth one victory point at the end of each round if you have the geisha in your play area. So having those will be straight up victory points. We have the doctor or the medicine worker. Um, these are going to help prevent you from losing people in contagion times, so you'll have to have those towards the end of the game in this case, although they may come earlier in other games. And we have the monks, which are going to be multipliers for victory points at the end of the game. You'll multiply the number of symbols on the monk times the height of the palace they're in, and you'll get that many victory points. So you'll choose one of these cards to play, uh, and you're going to choose and take that person from the area. You can take either the younger version, giving you more more people points and moving you up on the player order track, or you can choose the older version, which will give you more symbols, which will make your actions better when you take them later. Anyhow, each player will play one of these cards, the jokers allowing them to take any card and place the person, or any person, and place the person into their palaces. Each palace may only hold the number of people equal to the number of floors, and if you're already full up, you have to discard either the person you're taking or one of the people from your earlier areas that you had placed previously. After everyone has taken a new person, you're going to move on to the events phase. And as I said, in the first two rounds, there are no events. From that point on, the events will be different in their terms of order. Right now, these are all placed randomly. The only thing that matters is you can't have two of the same event in a row. These events are paying tribute, and the first thing that will happen in this event is each player must pay four yuan. If they don't have four, so let's say they only have three, they must discard one person from their palace for each yuan they can't pay. So if you don't have any, you must discard four people, and if you don't have them, you'll discard all that you do. The next event would be fireworks, and whoever has the most fireworks will get six points and have to discard half of their fireworks rounded up. Second place would get three points and have to discard half of their fireworks rounded up. So having fireworks will get you a bunch of points in this round. Then we have a Mongol invasion. For each helmet that you have from warriors, you're going to get one point, and you'll just track that on the victory point tracker. And whoever has the fewest helmets is going to lose one person from one of their palaces. So having the fewest would be bad here, and tying for the fewest will also lose you one of your people. Then we would have another tribute and another war, but then we would move on to famine. And in famine, you must have one rice for each palace that you have. Each palace you can't supply with a rice by discarding, you're going to lose one person from, and you'll have to discard them from the game. And those people are worth points at the end of the game, so you'll want to keep them. The final event that we haven't covered yet is Contagion, and this one automatically loses you three people, no matter what, unless you have the doctors with these little mortar and pestles on them, and for each mortar and pestle you have, you'll prevent the loss of one of your people. So three automatically prevents you for both of these events in the game. After you've handled the event, you're going to check and see if any of your palaces are empty, and if they are, you're going to lose one level from each palace that's empty. Uh, so they could decay down to nothing, and you could lose a palace entirely. After this, you're going to score points, and the points are going to be one point for each palace you have, one point for each dragon on either of these tokens you have, so this one would be worth two, cost you six dollars, or this one would be worth one, cost you two dollars, and one point for each fan on the geishas that you have. 
You're going to do this until all of these events are done. So you'll go 12 rounds, you'll play all of your cards, uh, and you will then score the end of game points. And end of game points are going to be two points for each person you have remaining in your area. You're going to get points for the monks that you have. Uh, you'll multiply, as I said, these icons tied times the height of the palace they're in. And you're going to trade in all of your rice and fireworks for two money apiece and then get one victory point for every three money you have. Whoever best manages to mitigate all of these disasters and take advantage of the good events, scoring victory points will be the winner. And there you have it. That is In the Year of the Dragon from Stefan Feld. Uh, now this is one that kind of gets criticized a lot because it is so punishing. And I think if you go into this game not expecting for this to be a game where you're just avoiding getting punished, uh, you might not enjoy this one. It's definitely going to be one where you, you have to just be trying to avoid not having bad things happen to you. Or trying to avoid having bad things happen to you, I should say. Uh, if you have going with that mentality, this is a really great game. It's very simple to play. Uh, you know, you're just going to go through the, the motions of choosing one action to take, then playing a person card, then resolving an event, and then scoring. And you're going to do that 12 times over, and that's the whole game. And right from the start, you know the order that the events are coming in, and you know what you need to get for each of those events. But kind of planning and picking and choosing which one of them is you're going to try and strive in, or, or do the best in, which one of them is you're going to kind of just kind of scoot by in uh, and how you're going to mitigate some of these disasters is going to be very important. Uh, so I think all of your actions are super important in this game. You really need to plan ahead uh, and you can do so right from the start, but it's not a complex game to learn, just one uh, that's a little bit complex to master. So if that sounds good to you, I definitely suggest checking this out. Uh, Stefan Feld, In the Year of the Dragon, a uh, great game. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.